Hi everyone, welcome to A Muggle's Guide to Hogwarts, where we are exploring the Harry Potter series with the ultimate muggle, someone who has never read the books, never seen the movies, and never wanted to until I asked her to. Very nicely, here she is, it's Becky. Yay, you finally said re- never read the books instead of never seen the books. I can't believe that I have messed that up so many <laughs> times. I have no idea why I was saying that. But no, she has never read the books and never seen the movies. Although she has read two books and seen two movies now. Yeah. Because we're on the third book. We're reviewing Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban right now. And we're getting through it. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, this book is much longer. The chapters are much longer. So it takes us a little bit longer to get through it. Even though we're only reading three chapters a week. But still. So we're here to talk about... What what chapters? We're seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. Oh my goodness! Seven, eight, nine. The Bogart in the wardrobe, the flight of the fat lady, and the grim defeat. So, what do you think? <laughs> Are things ramping up? It seems like it. Although I still can't quite tell like where it's going, but things are happening, right? Like it is a very interesting start to the school year. Because already we have like these Dementors, we have this fugitive on the loose, we have a lot of danger lurking around. We know right from the bat that this serious black is out to kill Harry. So there's inherent danger. And then we have this new professor that has like kind of a new style. And we had a very exciting chapter called, I still think it's Bogart. The Bogart <laughs> in the wardrobe. Probably up for interpretation. Yeah. Um, but I also liked that I was all upset about the illustration ruining the surprise of what the Bogart was. I was like, man, so now I know it's a mummy, (laughs) but it wasn't, it was whatever it wanted to be or whatever it was. It was more like a manifestation of individual fears which was interesting so what it turned out to be was way cooler than what you thought it was going to be yeah for sure for sure all right so let's get into these chapters the first one was chapter seven the bogart in the wardrobe yes but first they go to potions class with snape right which i think i predicted that that was going to have to be like reestablished as like snape hates Harry or Harry thinks Snape hates him or something like that. They have to do that every year. Every year, yeah. And that he favors Malfoy and all of this stuff. But they had something called a shrivel fig. A shrivel fig, yeah. Which, what is that? It's just a random potion ingredient. There's lots of weird potion ingredients that Mm -hmm. they use. And that is just one of them. I don't know. It, just, it sounded to me like like a dig, like an insult, like something you would oh, call someone. Oh, you're such you a shrivel shrivel. fig. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought that was funny. And then I wanted to ask you about something in the potions class because I think they they had to do a shrinking potion. Yeah. And it said something about shrinking the frog into a tadpole. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you how you felt about that. Cause that's not shrinking is not aging backwards. Correct. So as, as our resident marine biologist, how do you feel about a frog shrinking to a tadpole? Yeah, that makes no sense. Right. Okay. If if it was a de-aging potion. Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. And by the way, those exist in Harry Potter. Okay. So it would be like shrinking a butterfly back to a caterpillar, right? It makes no sense. Okay. A shrinking potion should just reduce you in size. Yeah, you should just be a miniature version of whatever. Like everything just shrinks. Exactly. Yeah. So this makes no sense. And then after, so in, in that part of the book, Snape is like tormenting Neville because mm-hmm. his potion doesn't look right. And then Hermione sneakily helps him. Mm-hmm. And when Snape tests the potion on Trevor, the toad, and it works, he gets really upset. And then he like drops a couple droplets of, a, I guess, like an anti-shrinking or an enlargening potion. And it makes them the normal size again. Mm-hmm. So that also takes him from a tadpole 
back, back into a frog. It doesn't yeah. make any <laughs> sense, Be- especially because later in the books, there is an aging potion, and I'm assuming oh. like a de-aging potion. Okay. So doesn't make any sense. They're just trying to be like clever and, f- and funny, I guess. Yeah, because. Because you couldn't say frog and smaller frog. You, just, you have to <laughs> say tadpole to really get your point across. Yeah, I, I, that's a weird one. That's yeah, a weird one. that is a weird one. But I wanted to talk about this because right after potions class slash on their way to Dada class, they're like Hermione was up, was behind them. And all of a sudden she was in front of them. And I just wondered if this was the first instance of like a time travel thing, if she is using time travel to get to all these classes she has at the same time, because they bring it up. She has like many classes at the same time and she's like, don't worry about it. It's fine. I was going to ask you if you had picked up on any time travel stuff. I think just that one. Yeah. So for those of you that didn't listen to the first episode of this season, going in, Becky knew that there was time travel involved somehow in Mm -hmm. some way this story involves time travel and so coming in with that knowledge it's a bit easier to kind of like even if you're not really paying attention you can pick up on those subtle like yeah oh she's not where she's supposed to be she's like in a slightly different spot or well and this would make sense too because it was a little weird how they handled it at the beginning when Hermione talked to Miss Begonnell privately about her class schedule and they were like making sure she could do all her classes and she comes out and like she's really excited, like she's beaming. And I was like, that seems a little bit much for just like, oh, I get to take all the classes we want. So I'm wondering if she has like special permission to use like a time travel spell and that's why she's so excited because right. like she's getting to use extra magic too. Well, I think you should definitely be on the lookout for those little hints yeah. because the whole time travel thing isn't revealed until much later, mm-hmm. but definitely when rereading it or I guess knowing beforehand, it's, it's easy to pick that stuff out. So yeah, yeah you're, that was, I mean, that was you're, pretty you're a obvious. very observant reader and, and it was pretty obvious, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but they're really spelling it out for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we get into our first Dada class with Professor Lupin, Looney Loopy Lupin. Looney what, Loopy Lupin. Who was singing that? <laughs> Peeves. Peeves. It's always Peeves. <laughs> yeah. So he's the new teacher that they think is like really competent and he does this like cool practical first lesson that kind of like blows their minds. They're like, this is the best Dada class ever. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone's a little apprehensive going in because all of their dada teachers in the past have been terrible and they're they're not quite sure about him because he doesn't really look the part like he looks Mm -hmm. he looks tired all the time he kind of looks disheveled so i don't think Mm, you think he looks disheveled don't they they describe him as kind of a little ragged i think well from from what i'm picking up on from his costume notes (laughs) that's what i'm usually getting costume well i kind of picture him as like just an old man who like continuously patches and repairs his clothes, like doesn't buy new things. So he's probably wearing like outdated stuff and it's just been like patched and repaired Mm -hmm. like within an inch of its life or whatever. But not, not because he's ratty, like just because he's an old man who doesn't want to replace his stuff. Like, yeah, but I, I agree with all of that. And I also think that, in this instance they're trying to convey that that doesn't like instill a lot of confidence in the students oh okay i thought they were excited was it just the teachers that are like oh we finally have a teacher who knows what he's doing well we know madam pomfrey said that at the beginning and we know that he like took care of the dementors on the train Mm -hmm. so we know he's capable but i think it's just like going into it the students are a little unsure because Mm -hmm. of they haven't had good experiences all all of those things tied in but then this amazing practical class that they have like everyone loves him now and they're like he's the best teacher we've ever had yeah cool professor vibes yeah so the practical is really cool yeah so they go to a wardrobe Mm -hmm. it's always a wardrobe which is in yeah it's always a wardrobe which is in the staff room i think this is the same wardrobe where once we read it, I was like, I think this is the same one where Ron and Harry had to hide that one time. Remember, they like happened to hide in a wardrobe or all the, or happened to hide in a staff room where all the teachers went. And then they found out like about Jenny, about something. About I Jenny don't know. Being but, taken down into the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, I think so. maybe. Yeah, maybe. 
They definitely hid yeah. in the staff yeah. room. So this location has kind of sort of been established before. So he caught a Bogart, Bogart, Bogey. Can we call him Bogey? No. <laughs> could, call him whatever you want. Just not Bogey. Don't do that. Uh, it's like a film term. Sometimes if like someone is accidentally walking in the background, who's not supposed to be, it's like, oh, we got a bogey. Yeah. Anyway, that's not what this is. No, it's a, it's a Bogart. <laughs> it's a Bogart. It's Humphrey Bogart. So Bogarts are weird and they're interesting. They're some kind of creature that likes to live in kind of dark, confined areas. Mm-hmm. I think they mentioned cabinets wardrobes under the sink even mm. under your bed sometimes mm-hmm. spooky and no one knows what they look like right because they always immediately take shape what if your biggest fear was a bogart would it look like itself i have no <gasps> idea oh my gosh it's a good question we should try that yeah so it instantly takes the form of whatever you're most afraid of mm-hmm. like your greatest fear mm-hmm. And then it tries to scare you, and I guess it can make you sad and scared. And Yeah, but it doesn't like being laughed at. It doesn't like being made fun of. Right. So that's the way they have to defeat the Bogart, is to instead think of something silly, and then it will start manifesting that, and then you can laugh at it. Yeah. Yeah? Did I get that You. you right? Ha- yeah, you have to like <laughs> picture your greatest fear and then find some way to make that funny mm-hmm. in your mind, and then you... Imagine that you cast a spell that's mm-hmm. called, the spell is called Ridiculous. Yeah, which is a ridiculous spell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> that's it's quite silly. And then you defeat it with laughter, I guess, or with happiness, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What would you think of that whole scene? Oh, I thought it was that's fun. A, that's a pretty iconic yeah, scene. Yeah, it was pretty, like, action-packed and funny and... You know, all the kids were getting involved and and then I was sad for Harry for being left out that mm-hmm. he didn't get to participate. Let's talk about that for a second. So Harry was it was almost his turn mm-hmm. and then Lupin jumped in front of him. Right. Because Lupin assumed that it, the Bogart would turn into Voldemort. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what it turned in for, to for Lupin? Mm, no. Okay. Don't worry about it. I was just asking. Can you tell me? I think it. they said that it turned into like a an orb, like a white orb. Mm. I wanted to ask if you had any ideas or insight about that, but it doesn't I matter. Don't, I don't remember the white orb for some reason. Okay. It happens like very quickly yeah. at the very end. And then at, afterwards, I think it's like Pavardi Patil's like, I wonder why Lupin is afraid of crystal balls. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, that's probably important. So Harry didn't get to go, and Hermione didn't get to go. Yeah, why didn't Hermione get to go? I think they just defeated it before she could go, <laughs> I guess. Gotcha. Yeah. But that was a fun scene. So that that instills like a lot of confidence in Professor Lupin. All the students really like him now. Mm-hmm. And we get a fun scene about Bogarts, who come up again later in the series. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think nice. it's pretty cool. So that was that was chapter seven. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk about chapter eight, the flight of the fat lady. I don't think a ton happens in this chapter until the end. That's where all the action is. But a couple of things happen. For instance, there's like Quidditch practice, and we're we're learning that Quidditch is a thing again. Harry's practicing. And also, Oliver seems very intense this year yeah. he's like this is my last year to win the cup like he is like he's in pretty it into, to win he's, it he likes quidditch a lot oh yeah he does <laughs> but i just there was like a a difference in him in this chapter yeah, like I a feel desperation like. yeah or just like an intensity or just like a ruthlessness that I hadn't seen before yeah and i think another thing that you we're pointing out as we were reading was that you were noticing weird behavior in the animals. Yeah. So I feel like there's been kind of like a theme of odd things happening with animals. Like we have Crookshanks and Scabbers that have this whole like Tom and Jerry thing going on, like 
all over the book, yeah. right? Yeah. So far. But then there were other examples. Like there was, was it lavender brown? Her rabbit was like killed by a fox. Right. Um, I feel like there's other even random, like Crookshanks is eating a spider. I don't know. There's like weird animal stuff going on. Because So the rabbit thing mm-hmm. was in the chapter where they go to divination class mm-hmm. with Trelawney. Trelawney made a prediction that something that Lavender dreaded right. would happen on a particular date. Yeah, on October 16th. And, and then this happened on October and 16th. She got, on October 16th, she got the news that her yes. rabbit had died. And Hermione, like confronts her is like is that really what you were dreading yeah. your rabbit dying your baby rabbit <laughs> who's dying. like has no risk of dying at all and it wasn't were- even like the day that it died it was when she got the news that it died so hermione's trying to poke holes and like her assigning meaning to this right right because hermione probably doesn't really like the divination class either and so she's trying to be like come on lavender like don't be silly but it doesn't really work so that was one kind of animal thing that came up. You're right. And then the other one that you mentioned, the spider, mm-hmm. was I think it was just a cat catching a spider. Do cats catch spiders? I don't. That seems weird to me. And then there's a the whole Crookshanks and Scabbers thing yeah, going on. I feel like there's a few more like kind of one-off like mentioned in passing, like some weird animal something, but I can't recall. Right. Maybe even like in the paintings, does the horse do something weird or... I don't know. But that's a good observation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, like I said, I don't think a ton happens in this chapter until we get to the end of the chapter. Harry has a little date with Lupin. A, a little date? Remember, Harry's like wandering around the castle because he's all sad that he can't go to Hogsmeade. And he wanders into Lupin and Lupin invites him oh, in for tea. Yeah. And that's when we see Snape come Snape in with the potion. The goblet. I don't know if it was a goblet, but in my mind it was of like smoking potion. Right. And Harry's really concerned mm-hmm. that Snape is trying to like poison Lupin. Yeah. With this potion. Why does Lupin want the potion? What is it spo- supposed to help him with? We don't know. All we know is Lupin says he's not feeling well and that Snape is making him a potion that not a lot of people can make to make him feel better. I've been feeling a bit off color. Yeah. The potion is the only thing that helps. So we don't really know. Off color. Off color. Interesting. So we don't really know what's going on, but that happens. So we get that kind of that interaction. We also, that's when Lupin explains to Harry what he thought was going to happen with the bog art. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, during this, Ron and Hermione are off in Hogsmeade. So we don't really know much about Hogsmeade at this point. Right. Um, But they're there and they get a lot of sweets and they bring it back. And then that night is the Halloween feast. Yeah. Wasn't it on Halloween in the last book that the ghosts had like their own feast thing going on and that like the, the crew, the trio went to the ghosts? party instead and they were like we can't eat anything and stuff happened yeah but do you remember what that event actually was about enemies of the air it was something specific for oh, someone's death day yes death day party yes oh, it was, okay here's newly headless nick's right death day party right 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 but okay so now at this feast the ghosts are here and they're they're performing in the Great Hall, which I wrote down, ghost synchronized swimming. <laughs> like, it sounds like they're doing some kind of, like, synchronized dance thing in the air. I just want to mention that this is, like, two sentences <laughs> at the end of, like, the feast where they're like, oh, and the ghosts did something silly. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I thought the ghosts were supposed to be having their own party. What are they doing here? Well, I guess he doesn't get a I death day party every, every year. Yeah. <laughs> every year, only when it's pertinent to the story. <laughs> that must have been a. It was a. It was a big milestone. Maybe it was two hundredth death day or something. Right, right, right. And then everyone's like, "Okay, cool, good feast, awesome, good, fe- good feast, everyone, <laughs> good great <feast>. work. <laughs> See you later. Going to bed." But then they can't go to bed. I know. They get to the portrait of the fat lady, and they can't get through. 
And everyone's like standing there and people are like, what's going on? And they're like trying to push through to see what's going on. And the fat lady's not there, but the portrait has been like slashed. Yes. The portrait has been damaged in some way. Mm -hmm. And the fat lady ran away. Mm -hmm. And then we're supposed to kind of deduce that it's Sirius Black who slashed the portrait. Well, yeah, Peeves actually is there, and he, oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. tells everyone that it was Sirius Black. Yeah, but Peeves is a liar, probably. Yeah, I wouldn't believe Peeves. <laughs> Chapter 9 is called The Grim Defeat, and this is where we learn a little bit more about what was going on with Sirius Black. So well, or Dumbledore shows up and he's like, everyone go to the Great Hall. We're all going to sleep in sleeping bags Yeah, and they together. have this slumber party, which sounds really fun. But I did have like a big question about this. Okay. Because he just kind of like does some magic and then there are sleeping bags for everyone. Why does any witch or wizard have to buy anything? If you're able to just like make things appear out of thin air... Why do you have to buy anything? Why is why are the Weasleys a super magical family? Why are they poor and why is stuff falling apart? Like if you can just make things apparate, is that the right word? Just appear. Why would you ever do anything else? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. And it's an interesting one. I don't think we have a lot of answers for it. Mm -hmm. But there are instances in the books where they bring up laws like magical laws like kind of like laws of nature mm -hmm. you're they're they're just limitations in what you're able to do with magic and they come up very rarely in the book because this is like what i think what people would describe as like a soft magic system like it doesn't really make sense and that's not really the intention of it there mm -hmm. aren't like a lot of rules and regulations on how it's actually used but there are a couple laws that come up. I'm not sure in terms of like physical things, but I do know that for food, for instance, you can't just make food. Mm. You, you can conjure food that has already been made. So it has to be made, but then you can like make it appear somewhere else. Gotcha. But it has to be actually made. You can't just make up food from nothing. Right. You can't just like... Like the laws of destruction of matter still yeah. exist. But then, so does, maybe he's just conjuring these sleeping bags from somewhere else. So maybe, yeah, I'm not sure if that like law applies to things, to objects. Yeah. But I, in my head, he's got like a room somewhere in the castle full mm. of like these sleeping bags that he needs just in case. You okay. Know? That makes a, that makes a little bit more sense. But he does, Dumbledore does that a lot where he just swishes his wand and things appear. Things appear. Yeah. yeah. There are some limitations, but I don't know where they are. They're not really fully explained in the book. Right. So then they're all trying to figure out how Sirius Black got in to yeah, right, Hogwarts. Right. How could he be there? Because the castle's so safe and it's guarded by Dementors. Mm -hmm. So how did he get in? I don't know. Well, I do know. <laughs> but you don't know. But you're not going to tell me. But who replaces the fat lady in the portrait? So Sir Cardigan comes over <laughs> with his suit of armor. Yes. That's the word. Yeah. I had a thought. Okay. Is Crookshanks serious black? Oh, interesting thought. And he's just like shape-shifting. Like what makes you think that? I don't know, because he seems like, why is this cat here? And the cat is kind of aggressive and could have slashed the painting and they think it's Sirius Black. And then I was like, what if it is Sirius Black in disguise, just kind of like lurking around? It'd be a pretty good disguise. But do you remember where Hermione bought Crookshanks? Yeah. And when she bought Crookshanks, the owner of that store said that Crookshanks had been there a while and nobody had bought him. Hmm. Could he possess a cat that's already exists. Maybe it's I a really, it's a really good thought. I don't know. It's a I really just good thought. Hmm. <laughs> so later in this chapter, 
Quidditch happens, and mm-hmm. it's the first game of the season. It's really, really terrible weather. Hog or Gryffindor is playing Hufflepuff. Right, they're mad about it. Right, because they were supposed to play Slytherin, but right, but Slytherin Malfoy's got out whiny, of it. Mm-hmm. and they're throwing off the bracket. So they're playing Hufflepuff with a new seeker named Cedric Diggory, who they're a little worried about. Mm-hmm. And it's a terrible storm. They're flying all around. They're trying to win. And eventually, Harry looks down and he sees the Grim on the field or like next to the field, somewhere around the field. And after he sees the Grim, he gets the feeling of Dementors, right? He gets really mm-hmm. sad. He hears he that really, screaming. Right. And he doesn't just hear screaming. He hears like a conversation. He hears someone saying, no, no, not Harry. Not Harry. Take me instead. Take me instead. Mm-hmm. And he he hears a, like a conversation between two voices. Mm-hmm. And then he falls off of his broom mm-hmm. and wakes up in the hospital wing. He goes to the hospital a lot. <laughs> And they learn that the Dementors came onto the field for some reason, like a ton of Dementors came on. Mm -hmm. Dumbledore saved him because he slowed his body down when he was falling. And Dumbledore made all the Dementors go away by Mm -hmm. casting some spell. And uh, we also learn that they lost the game, Mm. which everyone's really upset about. Especially Oliver. Especially Oliver. And that Harry's broomstick got blown into the Whomping Willow and totally destroyed. Yeah, that's sad. But he's probably going to get that other one that he really wanted anyway. That they mentioned at the very beginning of the book. (laughs) No. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Harry just doesn't get whatever the hell he wants. (laughs) I wanted to talk about the Grimm. Yeah. So are they using that? as like the name of this physical creature or are they using this as like the feeling associated with this creature? This, the Grim is the name of the omen. The omen? Yes. Okay. The Grim is an omen. But the shaggy dog and it's, is it just a dog. And it takes the form of a dog. Okay. So for this, like if you see a big black dog Mm-hmm. That is the omen. That's like the omen of death, essentially. Mm, like the black So spot. seeing that omen isn't good for Harry. That's and that's what, he's what it, about. that's what he saw even in the real world when he was catching the night bus too, right? It's, yeah. So he mm-hmm. saw the Grimm before he got on the night bus. Mm-hmm. He saw the Grimm in the tea leaves. Mm-hmm. And he saw the Grimm at this game. Interesting. Right before he fell off his broom and almost died. Yeah, but he didn't. And I think that's the end of that chapter. Yeah, his poor broomstick. His poor broomstick. What's he going to do? It'll probably be okay. Okay, I have a question for you. Okie dokie. So one of the cool things that came up in this chapter is the bug art. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with your fear. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, if you were in front of that wardrobe, what do you think the bog art would turn into for you? Mm. Okay, but I have like a side question about this because does it have to be something like physical, like something that could be represented physically rather than just kind of more like a concept? Well, it's tricky. It's not really explained. It's I, I think bog arts are supposed to take the form of your greatest fear. Right. But so if my greatest fear, well, I think this is similar for both of us because we've talked about it, is being stranded in the middle of the ocean without knowing which way to swim. Would it just, would that be my reality all of a sudden? Because it can't transform. I mean, would it transform into the ocean? I'm confused about how that would happen. I don't think it could. Like everyone else would have to be there too. And then I wouldn't be stranded. I'd be with everyone. (laughs) It it seems to me also that the, the bog art takes like physical form. Like it's a physical thing. Thing? It exists Mm -hmm. and it takes a physical form that exists in that time and space. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if, if your fear is more conceptual, or more 
place-based. Yeah, or like drowning. Then I don't see how it could take that physical form. Right. Okay, so if it has to be a thing. Maybe it could be some type of representation of that thing. Um, but that would probably be something that you would have to associate with it, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe a a specific physical thing that you associate with. For instance, if your fear is being in the middle of the ocean and not knowing what direction to swim, maybe it's like a compass that doesn't work or maybe it's, (laughs) I I don't know, maybe maybe it manifests some kind of feeling inside you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's tricky. Yeah. I think that feeling is something about like, being in a tough situation and not knowing the way out like you know usually you can figure out what you can do to make things better but in that situation no matter what you do there's a chance you're making it worse like there's a chance you're getting yourself further out into sea Mm -hmm. or whatever i don't know what that would physically be so yeah okay so let's pretend that it has to be some kind of physical thing oh i know okay what because I hate a particular type of movie, some kind of like demonic child. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That'd be scary. That would be <laughs> super scary. A demonic kid. <laughs> yeah. Specifically a child. Yeah. A demonic child. Ugh. Like an exorcist child. Uh, yeah, probably. I haven't seen it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Okay. How would you defeat it? How would what's I make your, it silly? Yeah, what's your ridiculous spell? <laughs> I think, because don't usually like weird things come out of their eyes or like, I don't know, instead of like bats flying out of its soul, I would have to make it something like really silly and funny, like butterflies or... <laughs> flying out of its soul? <laughs> yeah, that would be really funny, right? <laughs> if all these beautiful, <laughs> colorful butterflies just flew out. Maybe. (laughs) In the book, they describe Ron's fear as like a really giant spider. Mm -hmm. And the way he made it not scary was by taking its legs off. And I was like, that's still kind of scary. That would be more scary to me. (laughs) A spider just rolling around around without (laughs) legs would be more scary. More unpredictable. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. What about you? I don't know. Yeah. My fear is a little bit conceptual too. I also have a fear of like deep water kind of not knowing where i am or where to go it's not really a fear of drowning it's Mm -hmm. just a fear i guess of the unknown in that kind of circumstance why is the water deep necessarily is that part of it that like there's so much underneath you that you don't know about there's yeah i mean you you can be in the open ocean and just see black beneath you Mm -hmm. and that's terrifying to me serious black (laughs) <laughs> that's one of the reasons why i, I wanted to study bio, marine biology in mm-hmm. the ocean is because i wanted to learn more about that fear mm. um but anyway i think that would be hard for a bog art to turn into, turn into a big black you know, hole <laughs> you know an- another thing that i i really don't like and it's like it's kind of a fear it's kind of like a hatred is like i don't this is really weird and so i'm sorry for everyone listening how weird this is i really don't like cotton balls I really don't. <laughs> There's, it's they creep me out. I don't like them. They're like not my greatest fear in the world. But I wouldn't want a bug art to turn into a bunch of cotton balls, and that would be weird. Would would a bunch be worse or one giant no, one be worse? A bunch would be worse. A bunch because you you don't like the size of them either. The size? No, I, the size doesn't matter. It's okay. it's the feeling I associate with cotton. Oh, ooh. Um, ooh. I don't like that. I don't know. Then how would you make it silly? How would you make a bunch of cotton balls silly? Oh, my goodness. What would I do? Uh, They would turn into snowballs, and then I'd have a snowball fight with all my friends. That's good. Yeah. You do love snowball fights. I love snowballs. (laughs) That's what I would do. Great. Awesome. Okay, you ready for predictions? Yeah. Becky is now going to make predictions for the next three chapters of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, chapters 10, 11, and 12, and I'm going to give her some clues to help her out. She hasn't read any of this. She's just making it up as she goes based on what we've read so far. So I give her the chapter names. I give her the main characters within those chapters, 
and I give her the main places within those chapters. And if there's an interesting tidbit or interesting curio or something, some piece of information that's really handy to have, I'm going to give her that as well. Okay. So chapter 10 is called The Marauder's Map. Chapter 11 is called The Firebolt. And chapter 12 is called The Patronus. The main characters in these chapters are Harry Potter, Professor Lupin, Fred and George, Ron and Hermione, McGonagall, Flitwick, Hagrid, Cornelius Fudge, and Madame Rosmerta, Crookshanks the Cat, Scabbers the Rat, and Professor Trelawney. The main locations within these chapters are Lupin's office or the Dada class, the passageway to Hogsmeade, Honeyduke's sweet shop, the three broomsticks, Hogwarts Christmas dinner, Dada class again, and the Gryffindor common room. That's it. That's all the information you're getting. There's no interesting tidbit or curio, except for, uh, I guess I'll add one, the Marauder's Map. That's a pretty important one, but that's also the name of the chapter. All right, are you ready to make your predictions? Yeah, I'll I'll try. Give it a shot. All right. (laughs) So we have chapter 10, the Marauder's Map. And I think a marauder is like a... Isn't it like a criminal on the loose? Like someone who's going around trying to find bad stuff to do. Isn't that like a marauder? Yeah, I think of, yeah, I think of marauders like. Kind of like pirates. Kind of like medieval pirate. Yeah, pirate type thing. Yeah, they're bad guys, but they're like out looking for stuff to do to be bad. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm not sure if they're talking about Sirius Black, but I think maybe. Maybe Professor Lupin like shows him this map in Dada class because I I was thinking maybe it's kind of like, you know, all those shows where like it's like you got to think like a criminal so you can catch a criminal. (laughs) Oh, they're trying to get they're trying to get inside the head of a fugitive or a marauder when it's all kind of like related to Sirius Black or whatever. I hope the map is cool. I hope the map like does weird things or shows like I hope it's not just like a paper map but like maybe it changes or it develops or something that would be cool so that happens and then okay so I think somehow Harry gets to go to Hogsmeade and I I think maybe he just goes I think maybe he doesn't have permission to go because I don't know McGonagall was pretty clear that, like, he was not allowed to go. So maybe he just does it anyway. And there's a passageway to Hogsmeade. Is it, like, (laughs) is it underneath Hogswart? Oh, Hog, wait, Hogswart? (laughs) What's the name of the school? (laughs) Hogwarts. Yes. And the place is Hogsmeade. Hags? Hogsmeade. (laughs) He's always, but they do both start with hog. hogs. Yeah, I'm not crazy, right? They both start with hog, not hogs. Hogs. It's not hogs warts. <laughs> it's hog warts and remember, hogs mead. Remember at the beginning when I kept on spelling hog warts like Schwartz, like hog warts oh. with a Z. <laughs> I'm trying to forget. Uh, okay. So there's a secret tunnel passageway to Hogsmeade that's under the school, just like so much else is underneath the school. Miles. Miles and miles. Like the school must be so tiny compared to what's underneath it. (laughs) And so he goes there with Ron and Hermione and Fred and George, and they get to go to the sweet shop. And that's going to be super fun and then they go to the three broomsticks which I, I'm assuming is like a really cool broomstick shop and he maybe sees the firebolt again and he's like oh my poor Nimbus 2000 that used to be the best one is all in shambles and he really wants the firebolt but he can't get it maybe he doesn't have 
enough money or maybe he's like, well, I can't get this because then they're going to know I came to Hogsmeade and I wasn't supposed to come. So for some reason, or, or maybe the seller won't sell it to him. Mm. Mm. I don't know. He doesn't get it, but he wants it. And then chapter 12 is the Patronus. Yes. I, I don't know what that is. Patron is tequila, but I don't think that's what they're talking about. Uh, I'm going to go with like, it's like a gift giver, like a patron. Like, hmm. so I'm wondering if it's like their version of Santa Claus is the Patronus. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> so, cause it's clearly Christmas, right? There's like Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. They're going to have a big feast. Uh, maybe this Patronus comes and he gets the firebolt. Like it's like a Christmas miracle kind of thing. Like, oh, like, how did you know that's what I wanted? Um, that kind of thing. So he's all excited. But then Crookshanks and Scabbers. Now I was thinking about this because like they've had like kind of two big scuffles so far. And they've been kind of like harmless and silly, right? Like just ch like I think I said earlier, they're just like Tom and Jerrying around, yeah. but like nothing's really happening. But because of the rule of threes, I feel like this time they're going to get into some, they're going to like cause some big ruckus or get into some big fight and like something bad is going to happen this time. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then Trelawney is at the the Christmas dinner and sees a big bad omen again maybe she has like another like big spell of like woe is me everyone's mm -hmm. gonna die and then everybody gets sent home to the gryffindor tower um because everything's gone crazy that's what i got i like that <laughs> that's good you usually only say that when i'm really far off no <laughs> You're not really far off. I just like your ideas. Okay, They're cool. Very interesting. I like them. Well, thank you so much for those predictions, Becky. Now we are going to go and read those three chapters, and we'll be back next week to talk about what happened, if Becky was right, if she was wrong. We're going to compare everything. And uh, we might even have a little fun activity that we're going to do next week as well. Yay. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. We would love it if you could leave us a review, rate us five stars wherever you're listening to us, and tell a friend, tell a family member to listen in if you think they might be interested. We are having a great time doing this, and we love sharing Becky's adventure through Harry Potter with you. We're going to catch you guys next time. Bye. Bye.